In a world with artificial intelligence, how do we transform education? Thanks for tuning in. I'm Daniel Lopez, and this is the AI Education Conversation, where we explore the opportunities, risks, and impacts of AI across education. If you'd like to join the conversation, check out the AIeducationconversation.com. Let's jump in. Hey, everyone. Hope this has been a great week. While AI tools continue to develop in rapid fashion, guidance across school districts, states, and the federal government has pretty much remained the same. With so many school districts returning from spring break, we are in the final sprint through that testing season and that end of the school year. But on the horizon is the biggest opportunity to inform a change in strategy, planning, or training around AI for school districts. What am I talking about? I'm talking about that crucial summer planning season and those in-service training weeks that happen over the course of June, July, and August. So here's the situation we currently find ourselves in, however. I know that there are so many educators, education leaders, and schools out there ready to explore a change. They're hungry for sustainability in their work. They're ready for new methods to create more student engagement and lessons, assessments, and teaching practices, and they're tired. The reality, though, is that we're in the thick of it right now. I'm tired. You're tired. We're all tired. Learning is tough. Planning is tough. Reflecting is tough. The work is tough. So what do we do? While the way forward can seem really murky and unclear right now, because we're in the thick of it, I'm excited to share one school district's playbook. Maybe the best playbook I've seen up close and personal to date. St. Brain Valley Schools in Colorado. If you are ready for a change, I invite you to sit back and make a note of some of the many gems that Diane Lauer, Chief Academic Officer of St. Brain Valley Schools, shares with us today. Diane has so many deep experiences in education, leadership, and technology, and she was gracious enough to open up her playbook and school community. And I honestly just felt so tremendously grateful to Diane and to St. Brain Valley Schools for doing so. I also wanted to table set this conversation by saying that as someone who spends so much time reading about AI in education and learning about schools and districts exploring AI, I would put St. Brain in the top 10% of school districts I've learned about. Their vision and playbook is really robust and comprehensive, as you will quickly realize in listening to Diane. There's so much to take away from this conversation, and if you do work in a school or district, keep your notebook handy. If you're interested in my takeaways, check out the companion show notes in the episode description or sign up for the conversation at the AIeducationconversation.com. I share all show notes with my community 12 hours before sharing with my social media networks. Diane also gave me permission to share a tremendous presentation she put together on their playbook, which I will only be sharing in the show notes. But if you were late to shine up, you listen to this episode, you're interested in signing up, I will forward this presentation and share with anybody who signs up within one week of this episode dropping. So that gets in your hands too, if you're just listening for the first time. That being said, on another quick note, I wanted to quickly celebrate that this is the 50th episode of the AI Education Conversation. My initial goal was always make it to, pa- to make it past 10 episodes, since I once read a statistic that 80% of podcasts never make it past episode 7. Yet here we are, 50 episodes deep, still with so many conversations to be had. For those of you who have supported me since the beginning, thank you for your support. Thank you for believing in me. And for those of you just joining, welcome. You found a fantastic episode to dive into. If you want to continue supporting the podcast, a rating, a positive review, sharing on social media, a recommendation to a colleague, all of those go a long way in helping to amplify our space and host bigger conversations. If you have any other thoughts on today's episode, you can join the conversation at theaieducation.com or message me on LinkedIn. Finally, if your school or district or organization is ready to explore AI and make a change, I am available for workshops and consulting at the AIeducationconversation.com. Humans at the heart of education. Enjoy the episode. Diane Lauer, really excited to have you today. Welcome to the AI Education Conversation. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. I'm excited to be here too. Appreciate it. Thanks, Diane. Well, I, I mean, I'd love to just start a little bit and hear more about your professional journey and just the context of the school district you're coming from today. 
Absolutely. Well, I'm one of those teachers from the 1900s, right? As the kids say, I've been, <laughs> I've been in education now. I started in 91. So 33 years. And I remember trying to get computers in my classroom. I had a donated Mac Classic in my classroom. Kind of had to keep putting floppy disks, like two different floppy disks and exchanging them back and forth. And kids all got to try their hand at maybe using it different parts through the day. And from that moment on, just seeing how technology engages students, that really has always lit a spark for me. And so I taught language arts and social studies, but I had a really amazing opportunity to become a technology staff developer for a couple of years in one of my school dis districts that I was at. And that was awesome until I got tired of like crawling around under desks and trying to plug things in and reboot and restart all the time. And then I decided to become a school administrator. So I was a middle school assistant principal, principal, did that for a number of years and then headed on over to central office and became like a, a director of instructional coaches, professional development, then curriculum instruction. So pretty much the gamut in central office here and had a great opportunity to really think through making a one-to-one -one implementation. And so that was about 10 years ago. And so it's gone by really quick. And you and I were talking earlier just a little bit about AI and how, like, like for me too, like the first time I tried generative AI last November, I was like, oh my gosh, like, this is crazy. And you think of the span of, of, of a career and all the things that you can do. Like, I just, I can't wait to be able to use this more in the classroom. It's just, but it's a really challenging time because so like most of the tools that we're using are ages 13 and up. And so it's really been challenging us to, to think about the whole, the whole opportunities throughout our preschools to or grade 14 stance. So that's a little bit of my background, but yeah, technology, love it challenging sometimes, but it engages kids. That's what gets me inspired. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Thanks so much for sharing. And it's, it's so helpful to know that you've had just such a, a deep experience across education. And maybe just as a quick follow-up there, I'm curious to know with what you're noticing across the field with this like AI, I think phase or era that we are all in. I'm curious since you, you have probably been able to see multiple chapters of like new technological innovation happening over your career. Does this one feel like the biggest one you've ever been a part of, or does it feel comparable or smaller to other ones? I'm just kind of curious to, to get a, a context based on maybe other major chapters you've experienced in your career. Yeah, I, I, going from chalkboard to whiteboard was pretty miraculous. I remember the doc cam and I was like, what yeah. you know, as a writing <laughs> teacher, you able to put a piece of paper yeah. on and all the kids could edit it at the same time. So this does definitely feel like more. The first iPad, seeing kids with the very first iPad, like that blew me away. The tactile component, like just all the multimedia pieces of it, that was stunning. I think what's different with, with, the, with AI is so many of the things that you, I, other educators have hoped to be able to do as a productivity tool for ourselves to be able to really meet the needs of kids or to be able to create, to be able to create differentiated lessons, individualized approaches, just pulling in resources. I, I just think there's so much opportunity, feedback loops for kids. Again, I was a writing teacher and just, I still just teachers today has been an entire weekend or more grading papers, right? Like, I don't want to give that up because seeing the kids thinking is what, how I know what's best for them. But I just think there's going to be so many of opportunities for us to harness the power of AI in ways truly I can't, can barely imagine. So I, I, I think this is absolutely a huge shift. And I don't know if I can really articulate the size of the impact now, but it's going to be bigger than the iPad. 
the iPad was pretty amazing. Yeah. No, that's a, that's helpful context. I, I I was curious to just get your perspective there as somebody who's just seen more evolutions over the course of your, your career than I have. And so just getting uh, your your context of how you would right size this current innovation. So before I, I mean, and so much of this is going to be about expanding your ideas with with the work that you've done in your school district, which I'm so excited to talk about. And we'll, we'll table set that in just a second here. But just before we really jumped in there, is there any context you wanted to provide on the district that you're representing or coming into today? I know that I'm, on the presentation, I was had the opportunity to experience. You'd mentioned that your school district is around 33,000 students. You had around 5,000 employees in the district. So I wanted to just give folks uh, some context on the size and, and the scope of the school district that you're representing today and, and how you all are thinking about AI implementation. Anything else you might share? Sure. I am the chief academic officer for the St. Rain Valley Schools. We're located about 30 minutes north of Denver in Colorado. So we are we're have a metro orientation with a very diverse population. And yeah, so we're, we're the seventh largest school district in the state of Colorado. It's 33,000. That feels pretty big, but not as big as Houston and some other places. But it's actually a really nice size because we have enough resources and the economies of scale, I think, really afford us the opportunity to do a lot of in-house professional development. And we have had, we have an incredible superintendent, Dr. Haddad. He has been our leader for over 15 years. And that is fantastic because not only is he a visionary, but it's created sustainability. So the system has had uh, a lot of opportunity to build incredible people. And because I'm on the academic side of the house, my, my kind of jam is really building teacher capacity, putting the best resources in their hands. And, and we work really well with our technology side of the house. Like we're, we're basically married. And so that is critical when you're thinking about technology. Any system where the academic side of the house and the technology side of the house are not married at BFFs, you are going to run into problems. And I would say in this instance, that's really one of the things that's allowing us to, to move in a really strong way forward. Yeah, I think that foundational condition is helpful to hear because as, as I know I was telling you uh, in our, our pre-conversation here before we jumped on, I obviously don't have like a, a ranking system or any way to like fully uh, test this out. But as somebody who spent a lot of time researching and reading about school districts over the last 15 months and really trying to understand how folks are respond, I, I mean, truly you all are at least probably in the top 10%. If, I, if not, I would gather even higher in terms of like the way that I think you are foundationally and comprehensively trying to approach. AI conversations in your school, just as a preview to this entire conversation for folks listening. So I think it's, it's very helpful to hear a little bit about some of these foundational conditions. And one of the pieces that stood out to me about your district is the fact that you are strongly grounded in the vision of the, the vision of your entire district of providing a strong competitive advantage for students so that they're successful in a complex global globalized environment. So I think my initial question before we really get into specifics here is how did you all first learn about AI at the district level and make the determination that this tech technology actually does align to this vision of creating a strong globalized advantage? And how did you decide that it not only aligns to your vision, but this should actually be prioritized amongst the other things you could be doing right now with your time, capacity, resources, et cetera? Well, we've been extremely fortunate to have, uh, again, a, a really visionary leader. We've been thinking about technology and its impact for, for a very long time. We're adjacent. We have been to a number of, of large technology organizations like IB, IBM and Hewlett Packard. So having that proximity next to forward-thinking industry, Watson, I mean, I remember going to Las Vegas to look at Watson, gosh, probably uh, eight years ago. And I was blown away by it. And that was back in like, we're going to play chess and we're going to be able to do it. But even back then, they were showing Watson and the approach to as a human resources coach. And for me at that time, I was spending a lot of time with 
new teachers and helping them figure out how to get their license and how to answer some questions about, you know, getting their master's degree or how do I move ahead and so on and so forth. At that time, I was like, wow, if we had a human resources coach, like that would be so powerful. We hire 200 teachers a year and we have 2000 teachers. And one of the things we want to do is to help everyone continue to grow on their journey forward. So Watson was was our first connection, at least for me. And so we've been we've known about AI, the powers of AI for a long time. And we've been really thinking about when it comes to fruition, how might we or what might that look like for us in our industry? And one of the sayings that we have taken away from our partnerships with IBM is that it goes something like this. If you are, if you are, if all your energy is trying to maintain the status quo, you're already falling behind, right? So that level sets our entire institution. We do not hang out in the status quo. Our leader, Don Pettad, says to us, leaders look into the future and around the corner. I mean, it's something that he says to us all the time. And so we're all leaders here in St. Brain. Wherever we are, we take that as part of our identity and whatever role we serve. And so we're always looking out into the future, seeing around the corner to identify what might be and whether that's new legislation or laws or, or technology or just our, our environment, we're taking a look at, we're taking a look at that. And so it's really, it's really just been since November with generative AI that it was kind of like what shifted for me was I think we were waiting for companies to like come up with some kind of tool that that we would use or they'd incorporate it into a student management system or freshen up like a, an intervention for kids so they could get better at math or something in a in a more strategic way that was going to meet kids need but wow when they came out with just chat gpt and the open api we were all like whoa and our our technology services i mean you need to like no, we can take this. Like we can take this and we can make something because it was open source. And they're still buzzing about what that might look like. And our Department of Transportation, they're like, we could use this for logistics, right? Our finance department was like, we can use this with with what we do to do payroll. It's just it's just kind of, yeah, every, from the whole corner of the institution even non-student facing departments, we're all kind of like, this, this could be significant. And we're not just waiting for it to happen. We're, we're really curious. I think every time I talk to a vendor, somebody that wants to sell us something like, hey, we got a new blankety blank for you, whether it's credit recovery or some kind of curriculum. One of the first questions out of our mouth right now is like, what are you doing with AI? And you can tell a company right away if they kind of hem and haw and stutter and, and they can't tell you exactly how their business is thinking about AI and how they're incorporating it. Like right now, I'm just like, I don't think you're going to be around in five years. And I don't know, as, as a leader, that one of my jobs is to look at and recommend curriculum resources, things for our, for our colleagues. It, it, it makes me wonder like, hmm, so yeah, it's pretty pervasive and it's, it's going to be big. Yeah. I mean, there was, there's so much to unpack in what you just said from the fact that there are going to be, and we're already starting to see this, right? This like proliferation of products that are going to do their very best to like influence school districts to be adopted. And, and be the AI solution, if you will, within their school districts. But something I think that sounds like might be a little bit unique in your school district, would I, which I can definitely say is not happening everywhere, is there seems to be this like general proficiency or this like foundational context around what artificial intelligence kind of look like historically across like your school district for uh, key stakeholders and a lot of different groups in a way that just like doesn't exist in other school districts, like when I hear you saying folks in the finance department were excited about use cases or folks there, I'm like, that is just definitely not the case in some other places. And so it sounds like foundationally, you all were just a great place to really 
try to innovate and see what this and, and be a pioneer, right, for what mass adoption could look like here because of the foundational conditions that already exist across your district from the way that some of your departments are organized to some of the, the expertise across key stakeholders there. So it's interesting to, to just hear that. And I think speaking of, as you described, just the leadership that, that it, it was pervasive across your district, you obviously played a really critical role in, in, in laying, laying out the playbook, probably alongside a lot of other folks in the district to work towards making your school district an AI enabled organization. Can you say more about how you even begin to structure this like massive undertaking body of work with constantly moving targets in terms of like AI technology and the fact that I know in a lot of places there is still continues to be a lack of really strong, clear guidance. I think in Colorado, you may, there may be that, that may also be a state that's a little bit further ahead than other states. So you may have benefited from a couple of things, but generally speaking, the, the foundation seems like it's still, there's not as much there as it could be. So I'm just curious, like, how did you all decide to, to make this body of work? How did you structure it? How'd you go about that? Yeah, that is such a great question. And I love to implement things like that is my favorite thing to do. So, so I'm really lucky to be surrounded by amazing people who, who are super, like they know the tech side. Like I, I, it's been a long time since I had my hands really deep in technology as an Apple works trainer. Cause I don't even know if you know what that is, but yep, I did it. And so implementation, yes, this stuff, we knew it was going to be changing. So that just nixed any type of, I mean, and we don't really like traditional professional development so much anyway. Like if you're going to have a class and you're going to say every Tuesday night, you're going to show up and do something like you can't even, you can't even do that because the product that you have a Tuesday at the beginning of the month could be a completely different product at the Tuesday at the end of the month. So you just have to push that aside, which is okay. So then you, you take a look at that. The one thing that straight out of the gate, we just saw like in the fall with, with big school districts shutting it down, turn it off, turn it off, block, block, block. That all comes from fear, right? And what we know when people are afraid and they don't, they don't know how, or they, they just, they turn things off. And so it, it we did not want to be there. So knowing that it's motivated by fear, then that was the very first thing we like, we have got to reduce the fear and anxiety about this tool immediately. So that was part of the plan. So we couldn't have regular classes, reduce the fear and anxiety. And we also, our theory of action was really around, we need more than just the people in technology and the people in central office making the decisions. Because the decisions that happen every single day are with the teachers in the classroom. The teachers are the decision makers. So if we don't empower the teachers and have them with the knowledge, then they're either going to be blockers or they're going to be inciting more fear, or they could be using tools in a less, less positive or strategic way. So we knew we had to raise their awareness really quickly. So we have had success in the past. We're, we're, we're a huge social media district and we're 411 square miles. We have over 60 schools and we have got, we have our own hashtags. You want to follow us, just hashtag St. Brainstorm, get on to X. You'll see everything in our community. This is how we connect. So, so we used the tools that we already had in place that, that help us communicate with one another. And we, we're, we launched a bingo game. We've done this before with different things like, uh, you know, how to learn new tools in our learning management system. But this one's a lot more fun because we, we started letting people know that they could, if they jumped into AI bingo, we'd give them professional development credit. So it was a low risk, easy entry, asynchronous, get in whenever you can. And we gave them a whole year to do it. So we've got over 500 staff that are actively involved in the AI bingo. And you can get a half professional development credit. If you do three bingos, you can get a full PD credit. And in our system, PD credits is what moves you along the salary schedule. So you got to have some incentives. 
We cover it all. You get your 1.0. We strategically put in some of the, the bingo corners, we said, we're going to have a pop-up. So ed camps were really powerful for us when we launched our one-to-one iPad initiative 10 years ago. So I don't know if you remember all those like app slams and people would come up and say, this app, this app, da 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 And ed camps was really popular because at that time, that's the only thing we could think about when those apps kept coming, there was a new app, there was a new app, there was a new app. So that was in our memory bank with this one. It was like, okay, let's do the ed camps. And so we've run one of those every month, all school year. Most of them have been face-to-face because we wanted to do face-to-face, hands-on and post-COVID, but a couple of them have been virtual. And so we did that. And we also trained our principals. That's probably the first group we started training, actually. We've done a number of trainings with them. Principals go to at least one meeting a month. Ours go to two. And there's always some kind of AI opportunity for them. And that our goal was for each school to have its own opportunity to use generative AI during the year. And probably one of our secret weapons are our students. So we have... We actually have students who are who who are well beyond AI pioneers. They're like AI, I don't know what you even call them. They're like satellite riders. I mean, they're like, boom, they're way ahead. And so at every one of our pop-up and even out in our community, the, the students have been the ones who have been helping the teachers and the staff just do some hands-on work. And And we've really been trying to go for two different learning outcomes. One, how can you use generative AI in your personal life? Because if our theory of action is people who use it well for their personal professional life, they will use it well with the students. They'll be able to think how to use it well with students. You got to use it for yourself to be able to teach with it. So personally and professionally. And so each bingo square was kind of like, make a trip, like take a trip to Denver, have it make an itinerary for you or have it create a new cardio workout to work on whatever uh, over the weekend. And then, yeah, make a rubric, have it do, create an exit ticket, things like that. So we strategically have been going for those two different learning outcomes. And I guess the, the last thing is we came up with a school champion. So we knew we wanted a think tank. So we invited each school to nominate one to two teachers. And these, we meet on WebEx once a month. And these are our, these are key communicators. So this is the group of people, like every time a terms of use changes, like we got all excited because we're like, yay, Canva is going to let kids use it. And then we're like, oh no, when Firefly came, we're like, yay, we can use Firefly. So These are the people who can spread the word. They're the ones who are kind of like creating those vanguard classrooms. They're the ones who are using it. And the principals, then they have someone to lean in with who can help them lead some of the school-based professional development. And we're compensating these folks. Like they'll get for their time anywhere between $650 to $900 for their work, or they could get credit. So we just tried to think of all of our stakeholders and all the different ways that we could get people integrated from like a bottom up and a top down approach. Yeah, I appreciate you walking us through that because I think when I was, when I had the opportunity to listen to your presentation at the, the Sequoia Con conference led by the folks at Evergreen AI, shout out Evergreen AI, thanks for putting on a great conference. And it obviously it allowed me to cross paths and hear just the brilliance coming out of your school district. I was just blown away by the number, by the intentionality behind how you were engaging these key stakeholders and just the differentiated tactics that you were using to approach it, which you just kind of like walked us through between having student student champion groups, having some very selective other ambassador type functions, but then also including like broader training spaces, getting feedback from other groups and just recognizing everybody's going to come in at, and, and, and enter this conversation at different levels with different varying degrees of Uh, interest. And I think something else that you just said that really stood out to me, which I've also recognized over the past 15 months is I think before we can really dive extremely into the tactical of like 
how we're going to implement these tools, what tools we ultimately decide. I think you're absolutely right. That's something that makes artificial intelligence a, 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 a little bit unique from other school-based initiatives that we're trying to just, just implement in schools is that there's like a stronger degree of change management that I think actually needs to take place with this because there are a lot of misconceptions. There is a lot of fear, as you described, that is being mentioned in social media, being mentioned across media in general. And there's a lot of individuals who are coming with assumptions about what our artificial intelligence is before even having tried everything. And so I think the way that you all are approaching that, the way that you're asking questions, like encouraging folks, inviting them to think of things like, how can I use this in my personal life? And then using that to scale up in different ways, I think is just such a thoughtful way to really make this a productive uh, conversation across many of your, your key stakeholders. So I think for me, the only natural question that comes up now is knowing that you all have been doing so much across having really strong conversations across principals and school leaders and, and, and your school board and the student champion groups and all of these different things is what, what, what have some of the headlines around the response has been? Is, is there like a positive sentiment here? Is there negative? Is it a bit of in between? Like, what would you say are some of the, some of the key questions or, or key responses and headlines coming out of all of these different spaces that you all are engaging in? I think right now it's, it's very positive. We, there's a lot of trust in our district, especially with our district technology services to keep our kids safe. We all need to be responsible for reading terms of use and things like that. But, you know, we know that they do an exceptional job of it. and we're not going to prove any, any kind of, app. And, and they're reading and they're looking. I mean, so it's beyond the terms of use and reading the news and, and, and seeing how things are going. And, and we're, we don't have to be on the cutting edge, right? So we're not going to just open the doors and say, let's see how it goes. Like, no, we're. We're very cautious, cautious and, and progressive. Like we're like, yes, this, this will be the tool of the future. And we're going to walk towards it in a very safe way and in a very thoughtful way. I, I will tell you, okay, so helping to oversee some of the curriculum and we're a school district that has a guaranteed and viable curriculum. We've got pacing guides. I have to tell you, I struggle when I see like probes like, hey, you can make all these lesson plans. Like, whoa, we've been, we have teams of teachers who create lessons and we put them in our unit plans. We have unit plans for the whole district. And I have, even yesterday, we had our learning leaders, which is kind of like our curriculum coordinators, our instructional coordinators, our special ed coordinators. We were testing out Gemini yesterday because there's a brand new upgrade and now Gemini is embedded for all staff. And we've been testing Gemini versus chat GPT. Is it worth, do we have to stop paying the $20 per month? We're like, yay, Gemini. I, I did this one. I threw in a social studies standard for sixth grade. And I was like, I want to create a differentiated lesson for multilingual learners to help students understand various concepts of geography and ancient Egypt come up with three different lesson ideas. One of the lesson ideas was build a pyramid with sugar cubes. I'm like, come on. I know. See? <laughs> You're going to have a whole bunch of ants all over your classrooms. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm like, no. So you, it's, it's, there's, it's an opportunity to, to spark some new ideas and to create some things. But I'm not going to worry that it's going to displace what's important to us, but I do worry about, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to get into that space where it's kind of like, oh no, we're going to lose our guaranteed and viable curriculum for, for the sake of creativity. But at this, at the same time, it's, it's going to, it's going to create new options. And those new opportunities and new options are going to make us better because it's going to make us think about why we're doing what we're doing, right? Why, why do we, why do we have a guaranteed and viable curriculum? And what does that mean for us? And and will that will that will that concept change? Right. So I think it's just got me thinking a lot of different ways on how it's going to impact our systemic practices beyond building up teachers' knowledge and how I can use it for myself. 
I think one of the biggest challenges is using it with students. Because right now, chat GP, it's 13 and up with the parent permissions. Like, we take that very much to heart. Our teachers are not going to be using it in the classroom. If it was just 13 and up, it's 13 and up. But it's not 13 and up. It's 13 and up with a permission slip. So we have created kind of a process for teachers to craft a permission slip for their classrooms. And what they've been asking for is really they want a universal permission slip. So if, if permission is granted at one high school, then students could use it in all of their classes. Right now, it's, it's connected to the teacher that has that permission slip. And we did it that way because we knew that early on in the innovation, different teachers would have training and not everybody would. So to create that safety and security and to put, you know, make sure that the students were accessing it with teachers who had knowledge, we had the independent permission slip. But right now, we're thinking about how we roll it out in the fall. And so where we're at is thinking that we will have a universal permission slip if a school has at least one family night with parents and community members. And we are creating a module that will go into Schoology. The teachers will use to be able to talk about things like safety, privacy, ethics, as well as bias and diversity of thought and being able to understand the basics of AI and how, how AI is created, where the information comes from, just because truly that's what kids have asked for. Our students actually told us, they're like, don't just give us guidelines. Because we asked them, do you want guidelines? And they're like, yeah, yeah, we want guidelines. 96% of our kids said, yeah, we want guidelines. But that's not all we want. We want to be taught how to use this. Can you put it in our freshman seminar? Can you put it in a curriculum? So that's what we're working on. And so that'll be very interesting in the fall. And we're right now it's just chat GPT, but we're wondering what other tools there might be. So the parent part's really important because the because not only do we have to educate our students, but we we want our parents to understand how it's being used in the classroom. And we want to come out of the gate having family nights before kind of the concern rises up. Just like when we went to one-to-one -to -one with the iPads, there were some concerns around screen time or access or privacy or other types of entanglements that we want to have conversations with our families about. And we have a, a large number of multilingual student population. And so as we're thinking through our family nights, we, we really need to be very intentional about bringing in all members of our communities and how do we host these nights so that there's hands-on opportunities, multilingual access, and then we, so that parents can, can really conceptualize what, what it's going to look like. And so they can work with their students at home as well, because that's where the majority of the use is. Students are, students are using it through Snapchat or they're using ChatGPT on their own. And we want to help elevate knowledge for parents so that they can feel like they're part of the partnership with us and their child. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have like seven questions that are screaming at me based on everything you just said there. There's so much to unpack that I want to uh, be able to circle back on. But just to address the last point that you said, I could not agree more. And I think your, your, your tactic to prioritize family engagement even this early on in the process, like at the same time, you're trying to build AI literacy across like your, your, just your staff and your students to also prioritize family engagement, I think is brilliant because of the fact that as, as you, I think are recognizing early on that there, if, if we don't prioritize family engagement, there is a world where our students are going to go home and they're going to play around with a lot of these AI tools, such as Snapchat, such as video games, the Fortnite, Roblox that, that do also have AI embedded tools within them. Yeah. And then they're going to come to the classroom with very different proficiencies, conceptions about what AI is. 
than what we're offering in the school. And as you're, as you're saying, the parents can really be a bridge to this experience, right? And if we are allowing them to have a deeper context on what AI is, being able to create safe environments with their students to be able to do AI projects, maybe projects that we're assigning in the classroom that invite AI usage and then inviting the parent to be a part of that as well, that may create a very thoughtful bridge where we can try to sew together this experience between companies at home that are in incorporating AI tools embedded into their products on social media or video games or whatever it is for students and the products that we may choose to adopt in education around AI usage for the classroom. And so I, I, I just want to just co-sign that. I think that's great. That's such a, such a great tactic to use. I want to go back to something you said earlier, because it's, it's really screaming to me at this point. And I know that it's something that I've been asked a lot about. And I think you, you, you all better than other places may have at least somewhat of a, a strong answer to this question, which is you've mentioned a couple of times now that a lot of these tools, as you described, they, they require their users to be 13 years or older with parental consent, right? That being said, we obviously still want to try to find a way to cultivate some type of AI experience or learning or literacy for our students in K to, K to eight, right? Which is mostly who we're talking about here. So I'm just curious, like, as you think about those schools and those students, have you all thought about what the, the AI experience can look like for those students in a world where they're not going to be able to use tools like chat GPT? How are you, what is, what is currently your best thinking about how to develop an AI experience for those students? Oh, that's such a tough one. We just had our AI champion meeting <laughs> this Monday and I could just see the sad faces on our elementary teachers. They're just like, well, well, they want to use it with the kids. And at this point, oh, well, I think what we have some of our teachers doing is, is demonstrating it, right? So kind of demonstrating the prompt engineering. And I actually had that question. They're like, are we allowed to do that? And and I said, well, because we're in this new frontier. I, so here's what I say. I go, well, you are the professional in the classroom. And just like you might be showing a movie clip or a portion of a book that might be an adult book, right? Or, or something that if you're, if you're showing it to them and demonstrating kind of just this way that, that we're asking or how it's giving feedback. I think building that AI literacy is is important. So we're teachers dabbling with that. All I've spoken to so far is really kind of that generative side of using ChatGPT, but there's a whole other place. And for the last big wave of technology, especially again because we're 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 an iPad district, we talk a lot about are you a consumer or a creator, right? And so we are huge into robotics. We have over 200 VEX robotics teams in our school district. We have 60 schools. We had our middle school students at the state level competition uh, in Colorado last weekend. Our middle school students won 75% of, of the statewide yeah, tournaments. We, and, and five of them are, are going to Worlds. We have the top Oh my five, gosh. Yeah. And we have the top five coders in the, in the country. So the so we do a ton of robotics and that's one of the areas where we're where we want to continue to have students engage in in coding and the robotics and the building we also engage students in cybersecurity so that's an area but i think that for the for the elementary set i'm imagining right now we have high school students who are using ai sensors and they're putting them on different tools like robots and building apps for their smartphones to do sensing, sensing things. And so I, we're thinking about ways, one, building the AI literacy. We want students to understand where the information is coming from, how it is coming together. We want them to, to, to see how machine learning is created. But we also want them to understand this kind of prompt prompt generation how we're refining our thinking and then also how how the different tools right now it's ai sensors but it, it's going to be some other things how those can be applied to to some of our robots 
I do want to add one other thing, and that is really around metacognition. So one of the one of the concerns that continues to come up is that our our students won't be thinking anymore, that we're all just going to let the AI do it for us. And we all can we can all diminish that and say, oh, yeah, they said that about the calculator, too. But I mean, for some part, it's, it is right. Like, I mean, I use the calculator. Sometimes I'm like, I don't remember all my math back. I remember most of them. But I think that we really do want to be very thoughtful about students knowing what they know and knowing what they don't know. Probably for the last five years, we have really leaned into powerful teaching with Patrice Bain and Pooja Arjawal. And so that whole idea of retrieval practice and students' feedback loops, and so that students really have the grasp of, of knowledge and that they can discriminate between what they really know and what they don't know and what they kind of know. This practice of being very metacognitive is going to be critical in the future with AI. And right now, our, our high school students, the ones who are thinking about AI, I think with the, with the greatest level of sophistication, they're saying things like, I don't want to surrender my mind to the bot. They, they're really smart and they want to use it as a tool, not as a replacement for their own thinking. So going back to our conversation around elementary and middle school, I'm thinking about how do we really shore up our metacognitive practices so that kids are self-assessing, assessing their peers, giving feedback to each other. We need to elevate that practice because side by side, AI, I mean, we're talking about AI being like a partner in cooperative learning, right? Like, it'll be like, hey, kids, get in a group of three with your chat bot, right? And, and so, so that's where we're, we're really thinking of with the younger ones. And I'm still dreaming that some, some, some programs are going to pop that don't have those age limits. So, I think they'll come. They're just not here right now. Well, I mean, based on everything that you've said so far, I mean, I have no doubt that one of those programs might actually be created by one of your own students. Yeah. And that's a possibility. We may have a, an AI solution for your entire district that is created by a same brain student, which would be, I think, such an amazing uh, outcome and probably likely to happen based on all of the, the work that you all are doing across the board there. I think one connection that is really just screaming to me at this point, based on some of the things you said earlier around some of the lesson plan use cases. And I think how you're approaching K to eight learning at this point is that some of these AI tools are very exciting and interesting to use, but fundamentally, regardless of like the technology or the toys we have to play with, like strong pedagogy, strong instruction, and, and just strong intentional learning practices needs to be at the core of the experiencing that of the experience that we're hoping to build, right? Because using a generative AI to just create a lesson plan may not actually give us the type of skill development we're hoping to achieve with our students. It may not actually solve the problem in creating really authentic, strong experiences for our K to eight students. And fundamentally, what I hear you saying is that generative AI is a helpful tool in practice because it, it aligns to our vision of creating a global a competitive advantage for our students. But there are other ways we can do that based on the lenses that we develop with our students and other things we teach them. Gener generative AI isn't the end goal, right? There's, and as you said, That's there's right. so many other types of artificial intelligence that we're not, we're not even talking about. Mainstream media isn't even talking about things such as AI that is powering robotics, AI that is powering other types of use cases that may be equally if not more important in our society moving forward, generative AI, I think fundamentally one of the, th one of the reasons why folks are talking about it so much besides of the fact that it can be a, a tremendous productivity tool is probably just because in, at least in education, my, my thought there is at least part of it is because it's just fun to use and it's different. Right. And so yeah. maybe that's what it's, what it's really telling us as, 
as educators, as teachers, when we're teaching our younger grades is if, if, if we need to find a way to break out of the mundane, break out of the routines of just doing the essays, the short answer response, the multiple choice, those things to assess student learning, maybe what we really have to do is not look at generative A as a solution. Maybe we really need to ask ourselves, how can we think really creatively about the experiences we're creating for our students so that the work feels exciting, learning feels fun, it feels authentic, and, and maybe that's really the problem we're intending to solve. And yeah, having a generative AI tool that is multimodal can be like a Band-Aid fix to that because now you can generate like an image or something and assess learning right. that way. But it's not, it, and maybe it's actually not solving the problem, right? Which is just finding really foundational ways to invite students to contextualize their learning and create products that they're not being asked to do day to day because sometimes in a very lengthy, high demanding school year, it can be very easy to be in this like cruise control space where you're defaulting to the essays or you're defaulting to this. And it sounds like, again, what I'm even hearing from your students and based on what you said and just based on other studies that I've had the opportunity to read as an example is there was an episode I did with the, where they had actually surveyed 3000 plus high school students about their opinions and perspectives on generative AI. And would you, would you believe it if I told you, I mean, you might, because you're getting similar data in your school district, but they found that over, I think it was like over, it was at least 70%. It could have been as high as 90%. And you can, if folks can go back to that episode and hear what it said, but actually thought that they should not be using generative AI tools to write their yeah. personal statement. So they're saying that right. there's like these, these media that's messages right. that they're going to cheat, that they want to use it to, to just do that. And I don't think that's true. Students just want to learn right. and they want it to be fun and exciting. They just don't want busy work. Right. And I think if we can recognize that, that what, that's what this is and think very intentionally about the experiences we're asking students to do, I think you're going to find students respond very positively to that. They want to learn too. They want to grow. They just actually want to understand the purpose behind it. And they, they don't want uh, a school district or a person justifying a multiple choice exam is like learning as an example uh, when it's not. And so I think that's what I think our students are trying to tell us and in and, and many, many different forms here. Well, that's why I think some of us that have been really doing a lot to bring in authentic learning, project-based learning, opportunities for students to show what they know and to really create things, then if we were just in a place where write a book report, write an essay, yeah, I mean, it, you could easily use generative AI and I could see how people are, can really get sweaty about what this tool brings. But I'm so glad that you you heard that because for me, the real access and equity for our students is going to be how they can build products with AI. So one of the things that we had a student design team last year, we run a summer, I run a summer literacy program and we have students that created, they, they program Misty robots. So these humanoid robots and they, we, we use design thinking, like what's a problem we want to solve? I'm like, well, when we're doing summer literacy, we do a lot of gradual release and responsibility. We, I do to you do. We're not doing enough. We do in our teaching. And so they created a robot to be able to facilitate a guided reading experience with students so that the robot, but what they said was, and this was even last year, they said, we can't wait until we can program with us with AI because the robot was just, it was really, it was one dimensional. It was kind of like ask a question uh, or, or just ask an answer. And they had to code all the the potential questions and responses that students might have. But they couldn't wait to get their hands on being able to include AI into their robot creation. These are the, like, these are the skills. And so when I talk about consuming, boy, the, the generative AI, you said it, like it, it's fun and it's really kind of cool. And it, and it, wow, I can't believe that it, that it can do what it can do. But we as school districts, if that is consuming us right now to think about generative AI and how kids are going to use it for schoolwork, I really feel like that should be the smallest fraction of how we're thinking about AI and the opportunities for students in their future. 
we're already seeing how AI is affecting. We have an we have aerospace, we have cybersecurity, we have computer science, we have um, energy and sustainability. All of our high schools have career pathways. They're all going to be affected by artificial intelligence. And so students understanding how to create tools that incorporate these mediums are is students need to be spending equal time in that arena uh, along with the generative AI capabilities. Yeah, I could not agree more. I want to go back to something you said earlier because I'm really curious about your thinking here, which is I know that earlier in our conversation, you had talked about how right now teachers can essentially fill out this, this request form and opt in to bringing Chad GPT to their classroom. And it's, if, if I'm hearing you correctly, it doesn't sound like there's too many generative AI products or tools that you're currently allowing folks to bring into your classroom. And so I'm just really curious to hear more about if, well, I heard you mention Gemini as well. So are like, are those the only AI tools you have approved? And if, if so, I'm just curious, like, what are some of the considerations there between the tools that you are saying yes to and the ones that you're saying no to or saying, or you're just not responding to at this point? So just what are some of the considerations there? So Gemini is just made available for the adults in our system this week. So that means like we can download it in the self-service and kind of put it in class link and we can have access to it. Adobe Firefly is one that we have access to. And I could be wrong. But I really, I'm always needing to surround myself with my technology friends who keep me up to date on can all kids use Adobe Firefly or just high school students? I would, the, the main one that, so Adobe Firefly and ChatGPT is where it's at right now. We, we thought we could turn on Canva for students, but when we looked at it more closely, we, we still cannot have them access. And that might be a 13 and up, but right now, we have not enabled that for our students. So we know that students have devices, like they have their phones. We're not a, you can't bring your phone to class district. Although there are teachers who sometimes say, put your phones away or, or those types of things. But we know that the majority of kids have AI, generative AI on their phones and they're just using it, even, even in middle school when they don't have the permissions that they don't know if they do. And so they could be using it at home. So, so yes, we're, it's, it's, it's kind of limited right now to just Adobe Firefly and ChatGPT or 13 and up. And, and do you see that I, it sounds like, I mean, you're, you're thinking about changing the process as, as it relates to the permission slip for teachers, if they do some like foundational AI literacy training. But do you see a world where you all are looking to scale and add a bunch of new AI tools down in the future? Or are you trying to, like, is there some kind of decision-making yeah. framework there where you all are wanting to be very thoughtful and cautious about adding anything new? Or where, where's, what's that look like? Well, we have, we're looking at Conmigo, but I think we need to, we need to be certain that it is safe with children. And so that's a student facing program. I think we we would we're wondering how we're a Google district. So many of us are piloting duet right now. And I think at some point it's just gonna be intermingled in the Go, in the Google workspace, right? So whether you're using Google Docs or Slide Deck or those types of things, I'm imagining a time when those are gonna be available for our students. So we're going to have to entrust, if we're going to turn that on, that Google has put some kind of parameters around it. Gemini is separate, so it's not yet embedded in the Google workspace. And so I think we're also going to be piloting Diffit. We are piloting Diffit right now in different schools, but that's adult facing. That's not student facing yet. We use a program called Writable with our English language arts at the secondary level, even though all of our students can use it. And that's basically students are putting in their essays and then 
they have AI that is scoring the essays, essays, giving feedback to the essays. But right now, that feedback and scoring is going directly to the teacher. So that's teacher facing. And then the teacher can modify that or click if they go, yes, I approve. And then that AI feedback will go to students. But the teacher is the intermediary. I think that as we could become more connected to, to just as these programs evolve, I could see a future where writable, if it's, if it reaches a threshold of safety, that I can, I can easily see writable giving feedback directly to students. If that's all archived and we can, we, we can go through it and the teachers have access to it. We as Schoology as our learning management platform, they're already dabbling with AI. And so I can imagine how the learning management systems are going to be embracing and, and bringing these options in for students. So we are just such at the cusp. I mean, we're just really at the very beginning of where this is going to go. And we will just keep adding apps um, that, that meet our standards for student use as they come. Got it. That's helpful. Thanks for sharing. So it sounds like you all are taking it from really two different lenses. It's like, does, does it actually meet a unique need in our school for our teachers or our staff that like we're intending to use these tool? And then the second is really about, as you said, just meeting the, 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 the threshold and the, the standard we've set around the technology usage. And can I add one more? Cause the yeah. cost is another one mm -hmm. and there's different platforms that are coming out right now saying, well, this is will be $50 per student. I tell you, like, that's crazy money. Yeah, that's and a lot. So, <laughs> it, it's, it's crazy money. And, and so when you have a product, a startup that's saying, right now, we'll give it to you for free. And then you can pilot it for a year. You can use it for a couple of years. But then our price is going to be $50 a student. We're not even looking at those. There's no, there's no way. There's no way we could, we could, we could standardize on a product like that. And, and so that's probably the third thing that we're looking at. We, we're not big fans of free products because free that only lasts for so long, you're creating a mistrusting environment with your teachers and your colleagues. If you say, here's a product, get really good at it for a couple of years, and then we're going to take it away from you because we can't afford it. So I think that you mentioned ESSER money and where we're going to be and all these things. I think that districts need to be very careful with connecting with products that are going to let them use them for very low cost or free for only a short time. Yeah, that resonates and appreciate you for voicing that over because I've noticed the same. I mean, I've, I've been uh, privileged to have conversations with a lot of school and district leaders across different districts. And I have noticed over the last like two months, a lot of folks have been in budgetary conversations and walking out of those kind of singing a very different tune from the last few years. And I think it is because of this SR Cliff that I know we've been talking about for the last like 12 months in, in many education spaces. And so it does sound like maybe one way that a lot of districts might change their behavior a little bit over the previous few years is you just got to be really thoughtful. Make sure you know what the, the actual price is going to be. Don't, don't be fooled by an initial discount or something like that. And then three years down the line, it becomes us unsustainable and you're relying very heavily on this product or this use case and uh, don't actually have the funds to sustain that. So I think that's a very helpful uh, note there. Would you say that there's any other ways related to the broader strategy that you all are employing, which I would imagine does take time, capacity, resources, financial resources that this like Esser Cliff is factoring into your strategy over the next couple of years? Is it something that as a district you're talking more about, or is it something that you all have already been discussing? So it, do it doesn't feel as maybe critical as it does in other places. I'm just curious to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, well, we're, I think, really in a fortunate position. There were a lot of school districts that may have used their ESSER money to pay for humans like FTE and, and things like that. We were very careful to use the bulk of our money for one-time purchases or extended day or 
extended year programs, we didn't really buy a whole lot of new technology that now or or programs or services that now we're going to have to stop. And so that's just kind of our way. We're we're always we don't even write grants if we don't have a sustainability plan as to when the funding is over. So that's just our 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 way. I think that what's going to be a, a lot of these programs that have are using the open AI, at this point, you can still do a lot of the same things. Maybe it's a little bit harder if you're using chat GPT than, I don't know if I want to name any of these tools, but that, that can build you a rubric or can do some of these things a little bit more quickly. I think it's going to be fascinating to see which of these companies make it over the like the first three years and when they get to that pricing plan i think that school districts just don't have enough money to say fifty dollars for this tool and fifty dollars for this tool and fifty dollars for this tool because we still have to buy a math curriculum like you, you, you still have to buy the science curriculum like we're not we're not just going to be able to purchase some kind of lesson plan developer, one per teacher, and then have them make everything. So I don't know what's going to happen to to these companies once they stop giving things away for free and they run they run out of venture capital money and have to start getting money from districts. We don't have yeah. that kind of cash. No, totally, Diane. I think that's such an interesting thing to think about because it feels like at the there's, there's this very interesting dichotomy happening where it feels like things are going to be very consolidated because this disruption is happening and a lot of companies now are going to do their best. But this is also happening at the same time where there's almost like an arms race. And as like you said, everybody's competing mm -hmm. to try to like get their, their foothold in the door and like be able to sustain that. And I think underneath all of this is like the fact that for many of these like very specific education facing companies, fundamentally they're built off of Chad GPT, right? They're built off of Gemini or Claude or whichever they are. And so what will also be interesting is as those tools get better or as they get cheaper, will that then mean savings for schools? We could be looking up three years from now and what used to cost, as you said, like $50 per student because of the, the computational power to run that many tokens or whatever it is, maybe now is $10 a student. And so that could actually be of the advantage of school districts in the long term. But as you said, in the short term, there's just no way school districts are going to be able to afford that, especially at this exact moment where there a lot of federal funding is about to to exit schools, not not be reinvigorating schools. And so it's very it'll be very interesting to think about there. Going back to the broader strategy that you all have put into place, I'd love to just examine your strategy through an equity lens here. I know it was something that you had started to allude to earlier in one of your responses. So let me just ask you this. Do you think that a lot of the current tactics you have deployed around trying to engage a lot of key stakeholders in different ways, have they actually been very effective in engaging like marginalized students and families in your school district? And if so, what, why? And if not, what, what is that making you think about in terms of like how you might evolve your strategy to reach them as well? Yeah, absolutely. Career pathways and providing students with opportunities has, and in a really robust way, has completely changed our our community. And I'll tell you, we just found out about a month ago that we our district hit an all time high. Our four year graduation rate is ninety three point three percent for all students. Our Hispanic graduation Ooh, rate. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. And we have probably the most rigorous. Well, we have the most rigorous graduation requirements in the Denver metro area. And so so we believe by providing students with very strong, challenging, engaging, and robust experiences, it is, it is activating their excitement to learn. And we started off with one P-TECH program. I don't know if you're familiar with P-TECH, but it's a way that mm -hmm. a student's pathways to technology IBM was really kind of the front runner in this. And we started our very first one in our uh, most diverse high school where probably about a third of the students or, or half of the students are English language learners and with computer science. So they could get a associate's degree by the time they graduate high school. 
And it is, that was the first one. Then we created a biomedical one. Then we created a cybersecurity one. So we, we have very strong family student engagement programming, especially in our Title I schools, especially in our biliteracy schools. And we do a lot of conversations so that parents know early on that their students can have college access. We don't want any student to be able to say, like, I can't go. Like, heck, yeah, you can go. Our concurrent enrollment has, has, has just really grown exponentially uh, over the past 10 years. When you take a look at our, our graduation rate 15 years ago was at 75%. So to go from 75% to 93.3%, our Hispanic graduation rate just hit 88%. That's 3% higher than the state average for all students. Wow. And our English language learner, our graduation rate for those students at 82% is 20% higher than the state average for multilingual learners. And so why is this happening? Phenomenal teachers with phenomenal programs. So giving students hope, giving students access, families believing in a system that's going to set their students up for success. AI, absolutely. Like the AI is going to touch every single career. And so whether it is in our new pre-law pathway that we just started or possibly in our constructions management program, they're talking about, we just keep adding career pathways. Um, we need to provide students access and we need to be thinking about making certain that our career pathways are at the cutting edge. We've got to be able to provide students with the very best tools, the very best technology, so that they have that strong competitive advantage that for us is more than just a tagline. Yeah, that, that approach is really interesting. I hadn't thought about it quite in that way before. But I think as I hear you say that, especially just given my own experiences in education, it makes so much sense, right? Which is you start with building strong, rigorous career facing or academic programs that you believe in. And it sounds like when a lot of the ones that you just named are ones that are, are historically like not providing marginalized students an opportunity to be represented in those fields upon graduation, especially for black and brown students, things, as you mentioned, such as biomedical and engineering, those types of fields. And then once you have been able to be successful at enrolling these marginalized students into these programs, and they're already having this rigorous experience, then it already would make sense that something such as AI would be a complementary experience, a skill, right? A, a, a knowledge that base that you might build upon within this experience that you have, because it is going to be something that disrupts, disrupts that sector over time, how we may not fully know yet. But it, it is going to be clear that, that there's just the natural synergy that exists there. So, yeah, that just makes a lot of sense. I think that that just feels like, as we're talking about, really strong implementation, really building upon the strengths of your school district, and then asking yourself, how can you take this like newer initiative or technology and build it into the things that we've already laid that we feel really good about? So that resonates. Thank you for sharing that. What's, what's the end game here? You all have been doing... So <laughs> I just... It, I, I, I don't normally share video uh, components for these interviews. I just have the conversation, but just for folks who uh, don't say it, your eyes just were like, oh God, <laughs> end game. And I asked that because obviously you all are doing so much to cultivate AI literacy, creating conversations across so many different key stakeholders in your district. You're adopting AI tools. What, based on these things, but also recognizing this is a, we're building the plane as we fly here, just because of how the technology is working. What do, what do you all think is, is 2.0, 3.0 of this strategy based on all of the groundwork that you're laying right now? Wow. When I, when I think of the end game, it, it is, it is 100% of our students graduating and accessing their, their future, like accessing their future before they graduate. We want all of our students engaging in that post-secondary experiences multiple and having work-based experiences. We're talking about apprentices and internships. We want students, 
We want to stop delaying the gratification for students and saying, you're take just take these generic classes now and you'll get the good stuff. You'll you'll get the exciting stuff later. We want to provide students with real, real world work experiences now so that we're blurring the lines between school and life in a really meaningful way. AI, we're just starting to see how it can transform some of the things we've always wanted to be able to individualize education, meet kids where they're at, create welcoming, inclusive environments, and, and to really develop those strong bonds of our humanness so that, yeah, maybe we can spend more time building community because we have tools that are going to synergize our ability to meet kids' needs and to have them use these tools to self-direct their own learning. I mean, we can barely conceptualize that. So that that's the piece that I think is the pedagogy side of it. But when we start thinking about the career applications, I'm very much thinking about the consuming and using and creating. And so the end game is, for me, five years from now, I hope that we are spending as much time and energy or have as much present that we're using AI for our pedagogy and for our students to propel their own learning as much as it is intertwined with how students can use AI to create. I don't want to just teach with it. I want students to use it. That's a tough one. <laughs> no, and I think but such a good question. And I think my my takeaway there was just I think in so many ways what I what I kind of heard you saying is the end game is w- what it always has been, which is we're we're yeah. striving to make our students be as competitive as possible for this highly globalized, highly complex environment. I think underneath that's what I heard you say. And I think I also heard you say, like, we want our young people to feel seen, excited. We want them to grow. And I think that's, yeah, I mean, that feels exactly right. I mean, maybe the, maybe the simple answer is that the end game doesn't change. Saying, I feel like I need like six more hours to just pick your brain, but unfortunately I don't have that. So let me, <laughs> let me just close out with one other quick question and then just one other opportunity for you to voice over how folks might be able to connect with you. My last question would be like for school districts across the country, across the world for that matter, who aren't as, as far along on their AI learning journey as, as St. Brain is, what, what advice might you offer them about how to get started here? Well, get started. And, and I, I really do think that there's so much leverage and you got to start getting your teachers to use it and getting lots of people. We've had secretaries come into our pop-ups and just I mean, there's so many. It's it's really fun right now. Hook into the fun. Get the fun and and be aware, but don't let fear drive what you're doing. Enjoy it. It's it's just the beginning. It it does feel like magic sometimes. It's like Harry Potter. Like we can't even believe what it what it's doing. So let's enjoy this and think about things that bring us joy, right? A little Mary Kondo. And so let's just start there and try to, try to not, I don't know. I I would say, you know, the guidelines, the policies, all those things are really important. And then do things like what you're doing, Daniel, like listen to podcasts, carve out some time in your, in your week to read some articles Figure out a way to build your network with people who who can feed you that information so that you're 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 getting you're building your own awareness. And then I will say one last thing. One of the colleagues that I work with from Colorado, University of Colorado, Denver, Scott McLeod, he writes a, a blog called Dangerously Irrelevant. And years ago I got to listen to him at ISTE and ISTE's coming back to Denver again. And this was when social media started. He had us raising our hands like, 
How many of you are on Twitter? How many of you are on Facebook? How many of you are engaging in social media? And his provocative question to us was, well, you better be, because if you let this go by, your, your impact as a, in your sphere of influence will dramatically decrease. You, you will run into the, the worst thing that could happen, that you could become dangerously irrelevant. I have told all the people that I work with on my team, whether they're curriculum coordinators or or coaches and all of us across, like, we are going to dig into this. We we have got to use this. You're learning leaders. You have engaged. So because if you don't, you're not even in the classroom anymore. These teachers are using it with kids. If you're not doing it, if you're not taking the time to elevate your practice, you could become dangerously irrelevant. So I think that sometimes it's really hard to like, oh, one more thing. But if you want to have any participation in what's going to happen in the future, you have got to find some discipline and use it now because this whole thing is going to leave you in the dust. Oh, Diana, well said. I just want to close out with holding some space for you to just plug any channels or ways that folks can connect with you if you'd if you'd like them to. Sure. I can be, you can follow me on X at Mrs. Lauer, M-R-S-L-A-U-E-R. And I'm also in the St. Vrain Valley School District. And my email is Lauer underscore Diane at S-V-V-S-D dot org. I'd love to hear from anybody because I like to collaborate. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah. Diane, this has been such a memorable conversation. Thank you so much for your time today. 